Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the Rivercats 9 Lives podcast. Our guest this week is Giants legend Ron Wotus. We're talking with uh, Ron Wotus and uh, first of all, great to have you with us. Uh, I watched everything develop through the whole thing with the 2000th game and all that. And I want to talk about that first because that was that was pretty special. Uh, second most games uh, coaching in Giants history behind uh, Joe McCarthy. And I just want to take through what was that day like for you that that whole day? Well, it, it was awesome that uh, I was recognized for it because being a coach, you're usually not recognized for things yeah. like that, right, John? Um, yeah, first off, it's great being with you. I've heard so many good things about uh, you. Uh, I hear the best broadcaster in the business, and uh, it's nice to get a chance to Appreciate sit down that. with you on a regular basis now and get to know you. But, you know, back to that day, it was special for me because, like I said, usually you're not recognized for those things. And, uh, you know, you start adding up all the years and what you were involved with and all the wins and I'm proud of the fact that you know I was able to be that a part of that many wins and also be in the same organization for that period of time you know you were bench coach for three legends with Felipe Alou and uh, Dusty Baker and Bruce Bochy and they all were different in their own ways can you kind of talk about those guys and I know you learned so much from them as they learned from you but just those th- those three legends of uh, playing being a bench coach for those three well, you're right. I, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate uh, to have three different, ma- well, four managers, you know, counting cap yeah, right. now at the yep. end. But those three uh, in particular early in my career, you know, Dusty being right up from right here in Sacramento uh, was special to me. He's the first one that gave me the opportunity in the big leagues. And he was the right guy for me at that time because I was kind of you know, real structured and real maybe uptight, you know, in, in the way I worked. And, and he was the opposite, right? He can meet the president and he can meet a janitor and treat them both the same yeah. and you're relaxed. And he was real good for me. I saw the, the value of running a clubhouse in the relationship aspect of it. So I uh, loved working for Dusty. And, you know, we had some success there, too, with yeah. him. Uh, 2002, went to the seventh game of the World Series. We were always fighting for the division. Then you went to Felipe, <clears throat> I think the first year together, 103 games. And uh, he was great because he loved talking during the game and especially after the game. Learned a lot of baseball from him because we'd uncork a bottle of wine. And yeah. I got to learn wine from, yeah. from Felipe. And we'd go <laughs> through a, a bottle or two at the end of the night and he'd cold court. And he'd talk about baseball. And this guy has seen more baseball games than yeah. anybody alive between – minor league managing major league managing in winter ball he's he's at games all the time so it was a treat to be around him and then of course boach uh winning three world series um and he was like the other two and so competitive um all three of them were super competitive and 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 boach just had an easy way about him players manager it's kind of a combination of the two guys you know not as uh energetic is dusty let's say and 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 is not as enthusiastic as uh, let's say uh uh, felipe is in conversation after the game but uh watching his steady hand and how he dealt with everything uh was a real education for me as well you know it's kind of fun for you now come back to your roots a little bit you know you managed a triple a with phoenix and and what's it like coming back here and seeing the guys at triple a i know you you know you had a brilliant career in the big leagues but is it fun to come down here and see these guys it is, John. I, I have to tell you, I it was a tough decision to, to step away and say, you know, look, I, I want more time, more balance in my life is how I put it. I didn't want to have a full retirement. Mm-hmm. And um, this is the job we came up with. And, and, and fortunately, they were on board with me kind of uh, limiting my travel and doing this. And I'm enjoying it more than I anticipated, yeah. honest to God. I mean, I've been to San Jose. I've been here now for my seventh game, and uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, there's a, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of work to do. The minor league staffs are always undermanned, yeah. and um, it's uh, it's been real fun for me so far. Yeah, well, there's something about the AAA level, you know, just the guys are one step away, they're on their way up, or they're, you know, they've coming down and they're trying to get back. Uh, it's a pretty special level of baseball. It is. It's a great level of baseball. And, you know, um, as you said, you know, a lot of people say it's a tough place to manage. And Brundy's done a great job as a AAA manager. I mean, winning the whole thing a couple of years ago and the job that he does in Cabby and Tiny and, and G, the whole staff here. Um, it takes special coaches because it can be hard. You get guys sent down, um, you know, they're not happy, et cetera, et cetera. But I found it when I managed here and to be there around the guys now. I find that it's it's not all that tough in the fact that if that player has something that's keeping him out of the big leagues, 
you can work on it. You say, hey, this is the reason you're here. Let's get better at it. So you yeah. have a goal in mind. Now, if there's nothing, the player's just caught up in the numbers, then it's pretty difficult. <laughs> and then you got to manage that personality um, because he wants to be in the big leagues. Yeah, well, I mean, here you were. You got to the big leagues as a player with the Pirates, 83, 84. Did you have any idea that you, at that point, would would – kind of make your way as a coach and a manager and then come back to the big leagues as a coach I mean was that something in, in your mind at 24 25 years old not, not at that age yeah. you know but uh, I've always been a dirt bag as far as a gym rat you know yeah. played three sports in high school and at that point in time my goal was to make the major leagues I loved it you know yeah. Uh, playing baseball for money i mean i had a chance to go to clemson university in a scholarship and i chose professional baseball yeah. so that tells you where my mind was at um but uh as i got older and you know was in the big leagues had my injuries and then came back down to triple a i knew then that i wanted to stay in the game you're back in triple a for three straight years and you're not getting a chance to go up and that's when i really knew that i wanted to stay in the game if i had an opportunity Kind of an off-the-wall question. I know you grew up in New England and you grew up a Yaz fan. How, how <coughs> thrilling was it to be able to talk to his grandson and get to know get to know uh, Mikey Stretsky? That, that's a great that's that's a great question because it was fabulous. I was excited to have Mike Yastrzemski on my team because not only was I a Red Sox fan, but uh, Carl Yastrzemski uh, was my favorite player. Wotus is of Polish descent. Yaz is of Polish descent, yeah. and we, uh, we we always talk about being Polacks with one another. And uh, it's been a real treat. And I, I tell you, so Mike, he, he's got an autographed picture of him and his dad and the same same uh, <coughs> picture. And uh, Carl wrote to me, uh, thanks for being a great Pollock. And uh, they both signed it. And uh, I cherish that as much as anything um, that I have, just because when I was a kid, I actually did a, a book report on Carl Yastrzemski wow. when, I, when I was 10 years old. Wow. And uh, I actually sent Mike the first page of the book report uh, to show that it was grandfather. Oh, that is awesome, man. And what, what was it like, like going to Fenway, going to Fenway as a kid? Did you get to many games at Fenway as a kid? Not a lot. We went yeah. once a year. Okay. You know, my dad, blue collar guy. We uh, we didn't go a lot. It's only an hour and forty five minutes yeah. away. Of course, the Yankees were two hours away. We hated the Yankees, right? And uh -huh. we loved the Red Sox. That's the way it is in Connecticut. It's one or the other. Um, so we went once a year. And um, it was special, you know, the, the players larger than life. I can remember those days um, in, in, in my mind's eye of, of being a kid. I mean, it's still very vivid for me um, going to Fenway Park as a kid. And one of my more special moments, um, despite all the World Series and everything we've done in this game, is the first time I went to uh, Fenway as a coach. Yeah. And I walked yeah. around the park. I was there about 1 o'clock. I walked around. I went and sat in the bleachers where we used to sit and just soaked it in and oh. thought about my, my, my younger years and my dad getting me started That's in baseball. Great, man. Now, I want to talk about 10, 12, and 14 because each of those three years were all different. <coughs> but one thing they had in common was no one was picking you guys no one was that must have been really i mean you you get the first one you're like okay then i mean there was a confidence there was an air to this team uh that, that must have been really special just to watch it happen you're right and now 10 10 you know we knew that we had a shot at least i did because our pitching was so dominant and we have always built on pitching and defense and timely hitting. Yeah. Now it's kind of flipped, right? The 2021 Giants offensive. Yes. Uh, you know, we, we've really turned the page on that and with the analytics. But that's who we were. And in 10, you know, we knew we had a shot because of our pitching. We just scored some runs and the guys came through. So, you know, that was wonderful. Then 12, uh, honestly, to your point, we were never picked to beat anybody. There was a time in the middle of the season, I looked at Joe LaFay in the plane and we said, God, we're going the wrong way fast. This thing can turn. Next thing we know, Saves makes a couple of trades. Yeah. Here we go. We're much better, and we play our best baseball, and here we do it again. And you're shaking your head. Yeah. You know, how did we do that? And then it happened again in 14, and at this point, we believed. We, we knew we were going to do it again. Yeah. We, we were that confident that we had the players and we had been through it. But, you know, when it's all said and done and you're at home in the winter, you shake your head, and how did we do that? Three World Series every other year. Yeah. It was just like, you know, the stars aligned, the baseball gods were looking uh, out for us. As good as we were, you know, everything goes your way. And you're not used to that. You're used to not winning the last game you play. Yeah. Something usually goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, you win, you make it two out of three, but then you make it three out of five, and you're like, you must have looked at Boach and said, are you kidding me? I know. I should have <laughs> played the lottery those years. I don't know why I didn't. 
<laughs> Amazing, man. And that, that just uh, I mean, in 14 with uh, riding Bumgarner at the end, that last game, amazing. That, that was special. And one of my favorite moments is, and I, and I watched the replay, is when Bumgarner, you know, obviously he, he stuck it to him pretty good. They, they had no chance. They didn't want to see Bumgarner in game seven. And he comes walking out of the pen in, what was it, the fifth inning, I think it was, or fourth. He come, That plate was, place went silent. I mean, it went silent. And, you know, the, the great uh, producers, Jim Lynch, you know, they show the faces on the fans, and they, yeah. just, they, they just had a sad look on their face. <laughs> they almost knew the game was over. And what he did to close that game out uh, was unbelievable. Now, I know you've slowed down a little bit, but I, I just I can't visualize you not in this game and not in with this organization at some point. I mean, you, this, is, this game is in you, you know? Yes, it is. So look, I, when I stepped away, as I said, I, I wanted to have more balance in my life. Uh, I, I never wanted to leave the game completely, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to the Giant organization um, that they were able to uh, you know, keep me here and, and, and keep me in a role that, that I enjoy, and I think it's going to be beneficial to them as well. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm, I'm loving what I'm doing right now. You know, a lot of the home games, I'm at maybe 60 of the games this year in uniform, still yeah. coaching with the players and the coaches, watch it out in uniform and course here, Sacramento and San Jose. And I may go to Dominican, some other places. Um, we'll see how the schedule works out. But uh, I'm very fortunate to be doing it. All right. Hey, great to catch up with you. Thanks so much for the visit. And we'll share a, a black coffee uh, one of these days. Appreciate it. Yeah, we got to have a cup of coffee, yeah, Johnny. Do. I hear that. Maybe a Phil's coffee. For sure. Phil's coffee, Jacob's Wonder Bar, for sure. Okay, yeah. let's right. do Thanks it. Great being with you. you too. Ron Waters, our guest. We'll have more after this. Thank you for listening to the Rivercats Nine Lives podcast hosted by Johnny Dosco. Please like, subscribe, and share with all your baseball loving friends. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook. 